today's, oh, let me shut the door. So tonight's class is going to be the second part of the fallacies class from last time. I'm just going to be going through more of the fallacies to make sure that we're all on the same page with them. And then if uh, there's enough people at the end of class to make it worthwhile, I'll go over the homework that was due on Saturday. Um, on the whole, everyone did very well on the homework. Uh, I haven't sent them back yet because a few people are still turning them in. But um, yeah. All right. So the fallacies that we're going to talk about today, the first three are non sequitur, appeal to ignorance. I have no idea this ab. I really cannot spell absence. I have no idea how to spell absence. How do you spell absence? You think absent. All right, we're just going to make up a new word. All right, so the first fallacy I'm going to be talking about is a non sequitur. And remember, what are fallacies in general? Well, fallacies in general are ways of arguing that look a lot like good arguments. Um, they look like sound reasoning, but in truth, they are not good ways of reaching a true conclusion. So the way to think of fallacies is instead of thinking um, in terms of validity, uh, but think in terms of soundness. So we said a few times ago, a sound argument is one that's valid. So if the premises are true, then the conclusion has to be true. And a sound argument, as a matter of fact, the premises are true. So um, fallacies are things that look like good sound reasoning, but in truth are problematic. So um, the first type of thing we're going to talk about is a non sequitur. Has anyone heard the phrase non sequitur before? Um, okay. So what a non sequitur is, is another way of putting it. It's fancy Latin for just saying uh, irrelevant. It's utterly irrelevant. So a way a non sequitur works is it's a case in which someone says something as if it's a reason for something else. But in truth, the two have nothing to do with each other. And the one doesn't actually provide evidence for the other. So cases of non sequiturs are things like, um, you know, let's see if I can come up with a good one. You know, it's kind of tough living in America. That's why there was daylight savings last night. You just think about it, you pause, you're just, yeah, exactly. Nicole just gave the correct face. That is the non sequitur face in which somebody goes, like somebody says something, you're just like, what? Those have nothing to do with each other. Um, Nick, did you have a hand raised or was that an accident? I yeah, I had a question. Yeah. Um, so it, what, what's the distinguish, distinction between that and like ad hominem? Okay, so that's actually an excellent, excellent question. The way to think of an ad hominem is actually, it seems like an ad hominem is like a subspecies of a non sequitur. So in general, a non sequitur is something that is, uh, so you can think of it like this. Here's the things that are non sequiturs. And then within the non sequiturs are the, uh, so NS, inside are the ad hominems. It's just people call ad hominem something separate just because they're so prominent and so common that it's useful to think of them separately. But if something is an ad hominem and you call it a non sequitur, you are correct. So um, hint, hint for the homework. If you ever, one of them is an ad hominem and you just call it a non sequitur because the homework for next week is very similar to the one that was due this week, just with some added fun thrown in, um, that would be a case. So that's a really good catch, Nick. Um, but yeah, a non sequitur is like an ad hominem, something irrelevant, but you say it as if it's relevant. So uh, the book has an example. You often find these in commercials um, in which somebody will say something completely unrelated to the product, but say it as if, no, Antonio, I've not returned the homework yet. I was waiting until I had the last of them. I'm going to be going over them at the end of class, and then I will be sending them back uh, probably tomorrow morning. But on the whole, people did well on the homeworks. Um, so uh, yeah, so other non sequiturs are things like, uh, often I feel like, unfortunate, not to, um, my father's famous for, for non sequiturs. I'm not sure if it's something about like just old people in general or my particular old father, but you know, just like bringing up things that are irrelevant to anything else as if they were relevant. 
Um, so the book gave an example of something like uh, there was a United Airlines commercial that said something like, uh, humans are a social animal. That's why we fly to more than 10,000 cities worldwide. And at first you're like, oh yeah, that seems related. And then you pause, you're like, that has nothing to do with, they have nothing to do with each other at all. Um, very often, uh, celebrity cameos in thing or celebrities in um, advertisements are very often like, yes, it's a famous person and that's supposed to be, it's like an appeal to authority combined with a non sequitur. Anytime someone says something really unrelated, that's a non sequitur. Um, you often find them in, in politics too. So somebody asks a, a case in which somebody says something like, um, well, we're do what are you going to do to bring jobs back to the United States? And they say, well, back when I was a child, I learned the importance of hard work on a factory floor. And you pause and think about it. It's like, that's not actually answering the question. That's just a totally unrelated thing. So that's a non sequitur. Um, the reason it looks like good reasoning is sometimes like a non sequitur, if these things were actually related, it would be a good reason. So for instance, if you say like, a social animal, like humans are a social animal, therefore we have a really hard time staying indoors during a pandemic. That is a good reason. The fact that we're social and we evolve to be in groups makes it hard for us to survive in an enclosed space. The fact that we're social doesn't mean that United Airlines flies to 10,000 places. Like that's not now, if you say, because of the importance of experiencing 10,000 different cultures, that's why we at United fly to 10,000 different cities, that would be an appropriate one. Um, anytime, though, you just hear unrelated things and your like, impulse is just to go, huh? That's a non sequitur. If you find yourself making the dog tilt head, that's usually a non sequitur. All right. Appeal to ignorance. What do we mean by ignorance? Somebody who is ignorant, not meant in the derogatory sense of like, wow, that person's so ignorant, but in the original sense, what does it mean to be ignorant of something? Um, not be knowledgeable in that aspect. Exactly. To not be knowledgeable. So ignorant became an insult when you say, oh, those people are so ignorant because originally it just meant not knowing. And if you don't know something, then, you know, that's just a fact. But very often people don't know things because they various other reasons and it gets turned into an insult okay. so because of the importance of experience. so in ig an appeal to ignorance is a case in which somebody instead of pointing to actual proof of something points to a case in which there's not proof that it doesn't exist so this is the classical case of like uh somebody says do aliens exist and your argument is, well, we don't know they don't exist. Um, that is not a good argument. The fact that you can't prove something isn't the case doesn't show anything. So for instance, uh, Trump is notorious. I'm sure you got a lot of his statements for the third part of the homework. Yeah, um, Trump is, uh, I will say now that Trump is no longer president, it's gonna become a lot harder for you all. And especially because now the real, at real Donald Trump uh, Twitter handle is gone. It's gonna be a lot harder for you all to do well on the homeworks or come up with examples on the homework. It won't be harder to do well. It's just gonna take a little more work to find examples of non sequiturs and everything. Last semester when I asked people for examples of fallacies, I think all but one person just included a Trump quote taken from his Twitter. So it's just like, here we go. Say what you will about the man. He committed a lot of fallacies. I mean, I'm sure if you went on the uh, the Biden one, you could find some nice fallacies as well. But um, so appeal to ignorance is instead of saying, here's proof that it did happen, you say, you don't have proof that it didn't happen. So very often um, there are cases in which somebody will talk about a like, So very often, um, like whenever somebody was being accused of a terrorist connection back in like the early post 9-11 years, you get on a political statement and somebody would be like, you're accusing uh, or weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. The, um, the argument, people were coming forward and saying, we're invading Iraq. 
but there's no actual evidence of weapons in Iraq. Um, to which the government was responding, yes, but we have no proof that there aren't weapons in Iraq. Uh, or there's somebody would say this person has terrorist connections, like we're accusing this person or this nation has terrorist connections. And somebody would go come forward and say, well, what is your proof? What evidence is there that that this government has terrorist connections? Well, the response would be something like, well, you don't have proof that they don't have terrorist connections. So why is this a bad form of reasoning? Why is it bad to say, well, the fact that there's no proof that it isn't the case? Well, because by that logic, anything is possible. Um, it's impossible to prove that something doesn't exist because there could always be one hiding out there. So by the same logic, you could argue, your friend tells you that their favorite animal is a unicorn. And you say, there's no such thing as a unicorn. Their response in theory could be, well, you know, you have no proof that they don't exist. You haven't checked every corner of the globe to show that there are no unicorns. So that's why an appeal to ignorance doesn't work right. Um, it's not a great form of argument. Does that make sense to everyone of just what an appeal to ignorance is? Just saying the fact that I don't know this thing is supposed to be proof. Also, um, very often conspiracy theories are very tied in with an appeal to ignorance where someone will be like, ah, uh, you know, evidence that this causes, aut that vaccine cause autism. And then you go, well, there's no studies to show that. The response is something like, well, there's no studies that don't show it. It's like, well, that by that logic, I'm the king of the universe because you can't prove that I'm not. Uh, the reason why this seems like a good form of reasoning is that sometimes, uh, it is a way, if you should, if you look for something and it can be reasonably expected that if it was there, you would find it, then an appeal to ignorance or, or an appeal to not being able to find something is good evidence that it isn't there. So for instance, if you have a pet hamster and your hamster lives in its hamster cage, Why can't I draw? That's the real question. Okay, so this is your hamster's hamster cage. And if the hamster lives in the hamster cage and you go up to the hamster cage and look and the hamster's not there, well, that's a pretty good reason to think if you can't see the hamster that it escaped or it's not there. Why? Well, because if there was a hamster there, you could be pretty damn sure that you'd find it because it's a very enclosed space. So in a case in which like, it's a very enclosed area where if there was something there, you could almost be guaranteed to find it. That's a case in which the absence of something is good evidence that it's not there or it doesn't exist. In the same way that uh, if, if I'm going through all the homework assignments and I can reasonably expect that if you turned in the homework assignment, I would find it there and I don't find it there, that's pretty good evidence that you didn't turn in the homework. So in a case in which you can expect something to be there and it's not, that is a pretty good form of reasoning. In the same way that like, if you know that your shoes aren't by the door or aren't by the front door and you know you left them by a door, they're probably by the back door. But if you're just saying, we don't have proof that it's not the case, it's a bad form of reasoning. So that's the difference between an appeal to ignorance and absence where you would expect to find something. So if we had like very good reason to think that if there were aliens in the universe, there's only one planet they could live on. There's only one other planet that is hospitable in the universe and we go and look there and there's no aliens, then that would give us good reason to think aliens don't exist. But the fact that we just haven't found aliens yet doesn't show one way or the other whether aliens exist. Maybe they do, maybe they don't, we just don't know yet. So that's an appeal to ignorance. Everyone on board with appeals to ignorance? Okay. Now, the last one is a slippery slope argument. Has, uh, and then there's gonna be three more that we talk about. But does anyone remember, or does anyone know what a slippery slope argument is? Has anyone heard this phrase before? Yeah, it's kind of like moving the, it's like moving the goalpost, right? You can assume it's, because this is true, then a more extreme version is also true. Yeah, that's exactly it. So think about if you're standing on a slippery slope on like ice, it's if you start sliding, so like, you know, like it's an icy hill 
if you start sliding here, then you're inevitably going to slide to here, and that's going to lead to you sliding here. And the next thing you know, you're going to be on your butt at the bottom of the hill. So that's how a slippery slope argument works. What you do is you say, if this thing happens, then this thing's going to happen, then this thing's going to happen, and there's going to be some terrible consequence. So very often, uh, these slippery slope arguments are extreme cases. So there will be things like uh, slippery slope arguments were often used in like uh, anti-drug messaging. So, or very often anti-marijuana, like PSAs. So anti-marijuana PSAs used to include things like if you start smoking marijuana, you're then inevitably going to start taking cocaine. And once you take cocaine, you're inevitably going to become a heroin addict. And once you become a heroin addict, you're going to live alone on the streets. And once you live alone on the streets, you're going to die alone and be sad. You don't want to die alone and be sad, so don't smoke marijuana. That's a classical slippery slope argument, where you say this is inevitably going to cause this, this is inevitably going to cause this, and this is going to lead to some terrible consequence. Um, can anyone think of any other sorts of slippery slope arguments that people give? I feel like parents are famous for them when we're little kids. They tell us, if you do that, this is going to cause this, this is going to cause that. Um, can anyone else think of any off the top of their head? About having to stay in school, maybe? Like, if you drop out of college, you'll live on your own on the streets, and then if yeah. you live... And that same cycle. Yeah, it's the sort of thing where if you don't get an education, if you don't get an A in this class, you're not going to end up passing. And if you don't pass, you're going to fail. And if you fail the class, then you're never going to get a job. And if you don't get a job, you're going to never get on. You're going to not own a house. And if you don't own a house, no one will ever love you. And if you're never loved, you're just going to die sad and alone. Therefore, do your homework. Now, those are the like classic sorts of slippery slopes. And the reason why they're slippery slope arguments is that there's no actual proof that one thing is going to cause another. It's if you don't do your homework, it's not inevitably going to lead you to fail. If you don't, if you smoke marijuana, that doesn't guarantee you're suddenly going to become a crack addict. And that even if you were to become a crack addict, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to die sad and alone. You could get through recovery. You could be somebody, you could be one of those like rock and roll musicians who, despite the fact that you shoot up heroin 40 times a day, you're somehow still producing records. Like such people exist. There's not a guarantee. Um, so, uh, sorry, now my head is just like thinking about ridiculous stories of the Rolling Stones and other sorts of things. But uh, that's a slippery slope argument that, uh, does everyone know that about Keith Richards? So Keith Richards, the guitarist of the Rolling Stones, does anyone know what he did when his father died? He cremated him, mixed his father's ashes in with a line of cocaine and snorted it. So, um, <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, these are just, oh my God. Yeah, those no are just random. That's nuts. Yeah. So that the fact that you uh, do cocaine is not inevitably going to lead to somebody, you know, snorting their father, but I guess like rock and roll also things were like back in the day where somebody would like argue that like rock and roll music is going to lead to the collapse of society or if you listen to hip hop music then you're somebody who's never going to get a job and you're going to destroy them those sorts of arguments are all slippery <laughs> slope where you assume a is going to cause b b is going to cause c and at the end of the day the world's going to collapse the reason however why these arguments seem so persuasive is because they look a lot like hypothetical syllogism plus modus ponens. So remember what was modus ponens? If A, then B, or then B, and A, conclusion B. Well, and hypothetical syllogism was just if A, then B, and if B, then C, and if C, then C. D, you can conclude if A, then comfortable, no? B. So if you were to then combine this hypothetical syllogism, you could conclude if A, then B, or if A, then D. And if you knew that and A was true, you could prove this. So in a case in which it actually, so a classic case would be something like, 
dominoes. So if you flick this domino, it'll knock over this domino. And if you if this one falls over, it'll knock over that one. And that one will knock over that one. And that one will knock over that one. And that one will knock over that one and that one, blah, blah, blah. So if you flick this domino, it will inevitably lead to that one falling over because that's the nature of the dominoes. But the key is that they actually cause each other to happen. So in a case in which like, um, if you start, uh, or a, an actual case of, a hypothetical syllogism that's not slippery slope is something like, if you stab yourself in the heart, you will bleed a lot. If you bleed that a lot, you will bleed out and die. So if you stab yourself in the heart, you will die. That is a good straightforward case of hypothetical syllogism plus modus ponens. Because as a matter of fact, the nature of the heart is such that if you stab a knife into it, it will leak out all your blood. Marijuana, as a matter of fact, is not going to cause you in a direct way to suddenly become a crack addict. And becoming a crack addict is not a guarantee you're going to end up on the streets. Like, there are a lot of jumps of logic. So those are uh, any sort of fear-mongering or trying to convince someone to be terrified of something because if you do this, it's going to cause that. That is a slippery slope argument. Any questions on those ones? Sorry, what does plus MP stand for again? Oh, plus modus ponens. Oh, okay. Modus Ponens. I, all right, I, my spelling is like extra bad today. I'm just going to blame Daylight Saving. All right. Uh, pop, not really a quiz, but I feel like calling it a quiz because I'm tired of listening to my own voice. Uh, review time. Slippery slope for ad hominem five. Uh, false dilemma slash either or um, six, seven, eight. What are the others that go up here? Because I can't remember them. Oh, here we go. Appeal to authority. Two wrongs make a right. Two wrong. <laughs> Equal right and straw man. All right, review, what are they? Well, I happily sip water because my throat is killing me from talking too much. Anyone want to take a stab at just reminding everyone what they are? I mean, you can just pick a one. A personal attack? Yep, ad hominem is just a personal attack. Wait, say that one again. Um, well, five, I would say the false dilemma is when there aren't only two options, there's actually a multitude more. Yeah, it's you say something like, your options are either A or B, and we know A is false, therefore it has to be B. But in truth, there are many different options. So if you tell someone, you know, either give me your wallet or I'm going to kill you, and then they respond by punching you in the face, that's a side, that was a false dilemma. Those weren't their only two options because you, yeah. Um, appeal to authority. Which one was this? Well, that one was the mm -hmm. one where. Oh, Michael. Yeah. So appeal to authority is somebody uh, you listen to them just because they're an authority figure, even though they might not be right. Yep. Even though they might not be right, and even though they might not even have any any knowledge about the topic whatsoever. So this is the classic: Would you listen to your lawyer for doctor advice, and would you go to your doctor for legal advice? No. You only talk to somebody with power. And also, don't just listen to a politician because they got voted in. Only listen to them on things they're experts in. Like, I would definitely listen to Joe Biden about things like, uh, you know, how to get elected, how to be a politician for 40 plus years. I wouldn't listen to him on things like, I don't know, hair care. He's not an expert on that. Um, two wrongs equals a right. Which one is this? So just because it's, somebody else did it and it's wrong doesn't mean it justifies you doing it because exactly. it's also wrong. Yep, that's the classic one. So this is the case of, you know, mom, it's fine I did it. Joey did it. and he, Or another one is somebody, classic one is Republican. A Republican lawmaker will do something and say, say or a Republican politician will do something bad and then be like, well, 
this other Democrat did it too, so blah, blah, blah. Or a Democrat will do it and then point to a Republican and say, well, Ted Cruz did it, so it's fine if I did. So that both parties are guilty of this just as much, but that's the case. And then straw man, which was straw man? Um, in order to disprove the other side, they use an extreme absurd example. Yeah. And so if you, yeah, you would, instead of actually disproving what the other side says, you make up a caricatured version or do people know what I mean by caricature? Sure. I think that's how you spell it. Like have you've all been to the beach and there's that person like drawing the cartoons of people that are like exaggerated versions. That's a caricature sketch. Well, in the same way you come up with a caricature of someone's view. So instead of saying something like uh, people, so people who don't want gun control, who actually believe in the second amendment, uh, like rights, say what you will about them. They don't like drink the blood of babies. So, uh, if you say something like, well, everyone who, who's against gun control loves when children die, therefore they have to be stopped. That is a straw man. Nobody loves it when children die unless they're like a serial killer who kills children, but that's a different issue. Um, so taking a position that someone holds and then saying that they actually hold something more extreme and then showing that that extreme view is actually absurd that is a straw man argument. You haven't actually disproved them. All you've disproved is something that looks a little bit like them, but isn't the same view. Um, again, politicians do this all the time. You say that you're, you, you're, instead of saying something like taxes are gonna raise for the top 1%, you s say, my, my opponent believes that everybody should pay all their money in taxes and never keep anything for themselves. Well, that's, they never said that. That's a straw man version. All right. Everyone on board with all of these sorts of friends that we've covered? All right. Okay. Let me erase. And then we're going to go into the last bit, which is we're going to slow down a little bit to talk about the last ones. These can generally be grouped under the fallacy of misusing statistics. So, miss using stats small sample to unrep to sample and then three is I think questionable cause All right, so this, I really just want to open up and talk about statistics because statistics are one of the most easily manipulated and misunderstood ways of conveying information. So statistics in general, and what do we mean by statistics? Well, generally when we're talking about statistics, we're talking about sampling and using, so it's about sampling and using past to predict future. So when we're, what we're gonna be talking about here really is fallacies having to do with inductive arguments. And remember inductive arguments are about using things from the past to draw conclusions about the future or taking a small number of things to make to to justify a larger claim. So what we're talking about with statistics are cases in which somebody uses uh, past election results to predict future election results or statistics in sports. You use how somebody's done over the earlier part of the season to predict how they're going to do going ahead or something as simple as you look at someone's past grades and how well they did in school to predict how they're going to do going forward. So with this in mind, why do we use statistics? Why is it that we happen to use them all the time? Well, what is it about stats that is useful? Anyone just wanna, this is pretty, like this isn't like big picture or anything. This is just common sense. Like, why is it that if somebody says like, well, he got an A last time, <laughs> why is that useful? Normal, Sorry. Good no worries, right? Say it again, Nicole. 
Normally it's a good indication of what you're going to do. Yeah, it's usually a good indication of what you're going to do in the future, because generally things continue in the same way they have before. So if two things happened together in the past, that's usually a decent indication that they're going to happen in the future, especially if it's happened many, many times before. So another thing, however, is very often, so long as you're working in large enough populations, you can usually get a general idea, not just about how the, the present will reflect the past, but also how a small number of people will reflect a large number or how a small number of things represents the larger population as a whole. So for instance, um, whenever they're doing a, whenever there's some sort of election, and politicians are trying to find out or the news is trying to figure out who's going to win, they take polls. And what's the point of a poll? Why is there a, uh, what does a poll do? What are they trying to do? Predict who's going to win. And how do they do it? Do they ask Put every- Information? Yes, yeah, and they, they ask people questions, but do they ask every single person who's going to vote? No, they take a sample of what the population looks like. And yeah, they try to select. You don't have the time to ask every American before the election who they're voting for. So instead, you just try to select a small group of people and try to choose that small group as an indicator of what the population on the whole is going to do. So what you generally try to do is if you're trying to answer a question like who's going to win, you try to ask, you know, several thousand people to try to get a decent idea of what it is that's going to happen. Same thing in sports. Um, how many games are played in a season? Well, it depends on the sport, but generally afterwards there's a playoffs and these playoffs are not as long as the regular season is. They're generally a shorter, more condensed amount of time. So for instance, the point at the end of the playoffs, you not every team plays every other team. You've got say, in like the NFL play or in like the NBA playoffs, you've got eight teams on each side and each one of them plays one other team and then the winner moves on. And the thinking is even if not every team plays each other, as long as they play one other team, then that's enough to determine which of those two is better. And then once you have it down to like four on each side, then you go down to two on each side, like the NCAA tournament, the teams do not all play each other. Instead, they play one other team at a time. The better team moves on, the worst team goes home. And the idea is by this sampling of eight games each, the team who wins the most games is going to be the best team because you take a representative sample of games and that allows you to make a bigger prediction. And the reason why statistics are useful is because you can't get, like the human mind cannot grasp every single fact in the world. Instead, you just take a selective few and use it to make predictions about larger groupings. The issue is that if this strategy is gonna work, you need to meet, make sure that certain things hold. And what you need to do is you need to make sure that your sample is large and you need to make sure that your sample is representative. So what do I mean by this? Well, here's the idea of, um, you're trying to figure out, say, how good somebody is at darts. You're trying to decide whether you're gonna bet them in darts. Well, how if, they, if you just watch them throw one dart and they hit a bullseye, does that tell you how good they are at darts? They just pick up a dart, one bullseye. Does that show you how good they are? No, it could just be luck. Yeah, it can be dumb luck. If you do it just one time, there's always the chance for dumb luck. To know how good somebody is, it takes a whole like long, if you watch somebody throw a dart and for a hundred straight times they hit a bullseye, you can be pretty damn sure that they're good at darts. If they can hit a bullseye a hundred straight times, if they only hit it once, you really don't know whether they're good or not. It could be their first time ever throwing and it's just pure beginner's luck. And the next hundred times they miss. So small sample size, the idea is with a sample, you take a small number and try to draw a conclusion about a bigger group. 
but that only works if you take enough examples for it to be representative of something on the whole. I mean, every one of us has gotten lucky at some point. Like if you gave me a golf club and a golf ball, there's a chance that it's, uh, if you, on that one try, I could like, you know, hit the ball farther than I've ever hit it before and will ever hit it again. And that one time is not gonna show you if I'm good at golf. You need to look at a lot. Same reason that like base, the baseball season is so damn long or why sports seasons are long. Part of the reason is because they wanna generate revenue. But the other reason is if you win one game that doesn't show anything, you have to play for forever to figure out who's actually good at the sport um, that season. So that's the general idea, you just make it more and more. And this is why in, um, if somebody's talking about, it's the same thing with like, why did it take them so long to figure out if the COVID vaccine was good or not? Well, they couldn't just stab one person in the arm and be like, oh, well, they didn't get side effects, so we're fine. No, you gotta try it on a lot of different people from a lot of different backgrounds. You stab one grandma in the arm with a needle and she's fine, it doesn't mean anything. You have to try it out over and over again over a long period of time. So that's what small sample is. Related is unrepresentative sample. Does anyone think they can figure out what an unrepresentative sample would be? Random. So yeah, a representative sample versus an unrepresentative sample. One of the keys of sampling is you want it to be random, or at the very least, you want to get an equal distribution of your uh, sampling. What you don't want to do is if you're trying to make a prediction about all of a group. So for instance, if you're trying to figure out how what the overall views of Americans are, or what the views of men are, or what the views of people under 35 are. You have to get an equal like distribution of people being sampled. If you're trying to figure out what Americans think, you can't just ask people in your household because your house is not representative about Americans at large. In the same way, if I want to know what people at Baruch think in general, I can't just ask, like, what are what are people at Baruch's favorite activity on the weekends? I, if I want to figure out generally what people like, I can't go and ask the chess club. Why? Well, what does the chess club have in common? They like chess. So if I ask a bunch of chess players what they're doing this weekend, that's not going to tell me what the population on the whole is doing. It's just going to tell me what... Uh, what people who actively like playing chess are doing this weekend. Unrepresentative sample was one of the major reasons that polling has been so bad in the past two presidential elections. So in both presidential elections, the polls consistently underrepresented what percentage of the vote Trump was going to get. And the reason why was polling in the United States is conducted in a way that many Trump supporters weren't getting polled. So the people who are being asked, like they asked many people, who are you voting for? And both Hillary and Biden were at rates much higher than they actually got in the overall population. And the reason why was because the people they were asking were not representative of Americans as a whole. They were representative of a small subset of Americans. So does everyone understand what unrepresentative versus representative is? So if like we were trying to figure out what New Yorkers like, what would we have to make sure? I'm not. How many boroughs would we have to ask people in if we wanted to figure out what New Yorkers' favorite food is? Uh, you probably ask all five boroughs. I got to ask all five boroughs. What age ranges? All. Yeah, all the age ranges. You'd want all the ages. If you want all the demographics, you want all the races, all the cultures, all the everything, if we wanted to get like a general view on this sort of thing. So that's unrepresentative sample. So whenever you see somebody talking about like nine out of 10 doctors believe this or 90% of Americans support Obama. Well, what you have to do is make sure that the numbers they're getting that from, like if your goal is to show that most Americans are Democrats, you can't prove that by interviewing people at the Democratic National Convention. That's not a representative sample. In the same way to find out whether Americans want higher taxes, you can't just go and ask your Uncle Bob. Your Uncle Bob is one person. He might have really strong views, but he's not gonna show Americans as a whole. 
So everyone on board with these sorts of ways. And the reasons why these look like good samples or good ways of reasoning is if done correctly, sampling is incredibly powerful. There's a reason that statistics degrees and data analytics are such powerful, useful tools and why if you want to make a ton of money these days, going into data analytics is a great way to do it. Why? Well, because sampling and data is great if done correctly. You just have to run the experiments properly. So everyone on board with uh, this sort of case. All right. Now, the last one is questionable cause. Another way of saying this is you may have heard this in another context as correlation does not equal causation. How many people have heard this phrase before in this context? Correlation does not equal causation. Has anyone heard this? <laughs> Nick says he wouldn't ask Stan Island. Fair enough, Nick. Um, Stan Island, honestly, it should be part of New Jersey. It's closer to them. It's... Uh, it feels like New Jersey. They can have Staten Island. Um, correlation does not equal causation. Does this look familiar to anyone? Yes, I've heard it before. Okay. So let's talk about what it means because this is one of the most valuable ways of, or one of the main things to take away because this type of reasoning is very, very common. Um, treating cause correlation as if it was causation. And this is one of the main ways in which statistics can be tricky. So first off, what is it for one thing to cause another? And I don't mean this in some complex philosophical way. I just mean in your everyday life, when you say one thing caused another, what do you mean? One thing happens because of another thing. And that's the key. It's the because. It's almost as if, if the first thing didn't happen, a second thing would have happened. So if I tell you that, like, I ask you, why do you have a, why do you have a black eye? And you say, I was trying to brush my teeth and I slipped and I punched oh. myself in the face. You're buying me a new one. That's a case in which, uh, well, why? Because I caused myself to have a black eye. I once met a person who actually like, I, they broke their nose and I asked them how you break your nose. And they actually did the thing like in the cartoon where they stepped on a shovel and it came up and smashed them in the oh. nose. So that's a case in which like, you know, what caused it? Well, if they hadn't stepped on that shovel, it wouldn't have broken their nose. They broke their nose because of the shovel. So that's what we mean by causation. Now, what is a correlation? Well, a correlation is just two things that happen together commonly. So correlation is something that you learn through past experience. And correlations are simply things that go hand in hand statistically across time. So for instance, uh, a case of correlation would be like one type of correlation is a causal connection. So for instance, uh, if every time you eat pizza, you feel sick, there is a correlation between eating pizza and feeling sick. If every time you uh, stub your toe, it hurts, then there's a correlation between stubbing your toe and pain. However, causing things to happen is not the only way in which things can be uh, correlated together. So for instance, these two markers, for the next several seconds, their movement is going to be correlated together. When one moves one way, the other moves that way. When one moves up, the other moves up. When one moves down, the other moves down. You would say that their movement is correlated together perfectly. However, their movement, one does not cause the other to move. What causes both of them to move? Two. I am yeah, the one causing them. So just because two things are correlated together does not necessarily mean that one caused the other. Now, why is this important? Well, because as a matter of fact, people often jump the conclusion of if one thing happens and then another thing happens, the first one must have caused the second one. And this is a very dangerous line of reasoning because it can lead to some very, very bad conclusions. So for instance, uh, anyone who said like, well, I, I wasn't wearing a mask for weeks and then I put on a mask and then I got COVID the next day. That shows that my mask caused COVID to happen. 
Well, that's that's reasoning that someone has actually given. Like if you went back and watched some of those interviews that people gave about why masks are evil, these were the things they said. But really, is the fact that the, they put on a mask and then got sick the next day any sign that the mask caused it? No, if anything, it's a sign that they walked around without a mask on for two weeks and COVID takes a few days to incubate. Other sorts of cases are ones in which, um, you know, correlation not being causation. Correlation and causation was like the classic, confusing the two was like the classic idea for why one of your neighbors was, here's proof that my neighbor was a witch. Well, back in the day, what was the proof you'd give? Well, you'd say things like, well, my neighbor looked at me funny and then I got a tummy ache. That proves that my neighbor's a witch. It's like, no, all that proves is that your neighbor looked at you and then you happened to get a tummy ache. That doesn't show anything. So to jump from correlation to causation is a very flawed way of thinking. Now, when two things are correlated, that could be evidence that there's a causal connection, but it does not prove it. No matter how close the correlation is, it does not prove that one caused the other. Sometimes we've got a case of what's called reverse causation. So there's three ways in which correlations cannot be causations in the way you think. So sometimes, sometimes it's reverse causation. So we, two things happen together and person says, A caused B. Well, what really happened, as a matter of fact, is that B caused A. So these cases are sometimes hard to come up with, but you can think of them in, um, you'll often find them in like a medical situation in which someone will say something like, ever since I've been uh, eating more bread, I've been feeling, uh, let's see, I've been feeling ill. And so somebody might say, well, maybe the bread is causing the illness, but it might be the other way that when you are feeling ill, you desire a comfort food and what you go to is bread. So that's a reverse causation case. You say one thing's causing the other, but things actually go the other way. The other types are sometimes it, there's a secret third cause. So, um, there are a lot of classic cases with the third cause where, uh, let me see if I can remember the details correctly. So at various times in human history, there have been pandemics and plague. Uh, right now we have COVID. Back in the day, it was things like the Black Death and things like plague that were uh, passed on in different ways. Now, there was a great plague in London, I want to say in the 1600s. Now, during this great plague in London in the 1600s, someone made this really interesting observation. What they realized is the neighborhoods in which there were lots of cats were also the neighborhood in which there were lots of deaths. And so they looked at this and they came to the conclusion, well, if there's a lot of cats around, the cats must be causing the illness. The cats must be causing the deaths. So anyone know what they did when they came to the conclusion that cats were causing deaths? They killed the cats? Yeah, they, they killed the cats. the cats. They killed all the cats because the cats were clearly causing the disease. Does anyone know, does anyone have any guesses what happened after all the cats were dead? Did the disease get better, worse, or stay the same? Worse. It got worse. Yeah. It, why did it get worse? Well, it turns out that why were there so many cats? Well, the cats were there because the cats were eating the rats. And incidentally, the rats were also the ones carrying the disease. So it wasn't the fact the cats were not causing the disease. Rather, both the disease and the cats were being caused by the hidden cause, the rats. There were rats everywhere. The rats were killing people with the disease. And also because there were rats everywhere, the cats, which liked eating the rats, were eating the rats and everywhere. So by miscalculating the cause, they accidentally made things worse. So this is the sort of case in which there can be a third cause. The final case is just pure dumb luck. 
sometimes if you look at a large enough set of samples, sometimes things happen to be correlated together just by pure dumb luck. If there's enough people in the universe trying something, eventually a total novice is going to succeed. It's unlikely, but if enough people try it, it's going to happen. And in the same way, if you look at enough random things, eventually, if you look at enough random events, something totally unexpected is going to happen. You know, um, if you end up, if you throw a pencil at your friend's face enough times, eventually you're going to stab them in the eye. Uh, so it's just pure dumb luck. In the same way, if you look at, you know, the squirrel population in Manhattan, and you look at you know how many hamburgers were eaten, eventually there's gonna be a day in which they're both the highest on the same day. And so you might look at this and be like, wow, squirrel population caused hamburgers to be eaten. When in truth, it's just pure dumb luck. So, um, and if you actually look at statistics, there are classic cases of this. Uh, I can't remember the website right now, so I'm not gonna try to pull it up, but there are like really, really strong correlations where like, if you looked at this, in a scientific, uh, like this would pass the criteria of statistically significant. There's a statistically significant correlation, or at least there was for like 10 years between how many people drown in motorboat accidents and how many movies Nicolas Cage makes in a year. So like the more Nicolas Cage movies, the more people drown. Why? Well, because it's pure dumb luck. You look at enough statistics and eventually you're gonna find correlations. So does this make sense to people? So just because two things happen together, don't assume that one caused the other. Other cases in which um, vaccines and autism, this is another classic case of correlation does not equal causation. What happened, how the idea that vaccines cause autism got off the ground is that, well, here's what happened. A lot of people, a lot of babies got vaccines at about age, I think it was age two. And then shortly thereafter, they started showing signs of autism. Now, parents started going, oh my God, the vaccine caused my children to get autism. But that wasn't actually what happened. Did anyone know why these children started showing signs of autism shortly after their vaccines? Well, just so happens that you get vaccines at age two and also the signs of autism start showing up at two. You cannot identify autism in an infant. Instead, they only start to show the signs around two. So therefore this child, whether they got the vaccines or not, was gonna start showing signs of autism. The vaccines did not in any way cause it. So here's another classic case of correlation not equaling causation. All right, any last questions on this stuff? questions, comments, concerns, feelings. All right, let me briefly erase this, pull up the homework, and I will power through what the answers to the homework were. Um, so again, I will be sending those back probably tomorrow morning. But let me share my screen, and then I will go over the homeworks. All right, where is screen share? Da, da, da. All right. Share. Let's make sure that this is visible. Can everyone see it okay? Yes. All right. Yep, we're good. Okay. It's okay that I cheated on my homework because Mark also cheated. Um, you know what? It's 645. It's daylight savings. I'm just going to plow through these instead of asking people. So I'm just going to give you the answers and then we'll go. So first one, I cheated on my homework. So that's two wrongs make a right. Second one, you're either a cat or a dog person. I know you don't like cats, so you must be a dog. That was a false dilemma. Um, if you argued that it wasn't a false dilemma and was perfectly fine, as long as you put reasons, you got some credit. Three, all dogs have teeth. Fluffy is a dog, therefore Fluffy has teeth. That is not a fallacy. Donald Trump said the election was stolen, but he's old. That's an ad hominem. It's going to be especially cold this winter. Alexia, uh, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez said so. That is appeal to authority. Six was tough. The key here is that I didn't actually utter this statement. I did not say that critical thinking is the most important thing ever. Therefore, this is a straw man. I never said it. You're, I said critical thinking is very important and valuable. I never said it's the most important thing. Seven was a perfectly fine case of uh, modus ponens. It is a valid argument. Granted, it is not sound. It is possible to look at the sun and not go blind. 
but it is technically speaking a perfectly valid argument. Eight is also not a fallacy. This one was also a little tricky. The reason why is that this is a case in which the judge is not simply an authority figure. The judge is somebody who is an expert on the law and also has the power to send you to jail. So if the judge tells you you're going to jail for six months, that means that that's true. They are an expert. Nine is a false dilemma. And then 10 is a two wrongs make a right. Everyone who gave an answer for part three got full credit on it. They were very creative. Um, I enjoy reading them. They always make me chuckle. All right. Uh, that is all I have to say on the homework. That is all I have to say on tonight. And you are all free to go. There is another homework due on Saturday. Again, if you have any questions, just let me know. It's very similar to this last one. So if you did well on the last one, which most people did, you are ready to go on the next one. I will see you all next Monday. Have a great rest of your week. Thank you. Bye. Thank right. you. Bye. Bye.